Welcome to the Authentic Change Podcast. I'm Mike Horn, your host. And this podcast is for leaders and coaches who need and want fresh perspectives on what it means to live and to lead authentically. You're a leader who wants to make a difference, but sometimes you feel stuck. You know there's more to life and to leadership than what you're currently experiencing. It can be tough to figure out how to grow as a leader. You might be reading all the blogs and books, but it still feels like you're not making progress. You might even be feeling like you're doing everything wrong. On Authentic Change with Mike Horn, we interview experts who share their insights on how to live and lead authentically. Our guests are trendsetters in building great leaders, teams, and organizations. We provide fresh perspectives on what it means to live with purpose and authenticity. Welcome to this episode of the Authentic Change Podcast. Welcome to this episode of Authentic Change with Mike Horn. I'm absolutely delighted to have in the virtual studio today, Luke Iorio. And I'm only going to say a few words about Luke today because he's got such a rich story that uh, I hope in all of the uh, angles, the dimensions, the intersections that uh, we discuss at, uh, on authenticity and leadership, Luke will bring to bear, bring to light. Uh, he'll illuminate his experiences. But he's a, a podcaster, a, a host of a top podcast on this walk. And that's where you can find out more about Luke Iorio uh, is on this walk.com. And you'll find out lots more about Luke there. Uh, he has, I'll just say a little bit, um, he's walked alongside thousands of clients and listeners as they search for meaning, purpose, and alignment. And he's eager to share what he's learned. So I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, Luke, ask you to describe yourself to our uh, listeners. Sure, sure. Mike, thanks you. Thank you so much for for having me here and on the on the show. Yeah, as you mentioned, I've got quite a quite a varied background. Today, you can find me podcasting. I do a bit of private coaching uh, that tends to be more on transformational work, uh, meaning really working on individuals' consciousness and on their path and helping them really rediscover and remember who it is that they are. Uh, I've also got a series of, of group and circling type programs that I do that with. Uh, but how I got here uh, is a different story. I had the good fortune of in my mid-20s, Number one of of changing directions through a variety of different events that that were unfolding in my life had really recognized that the path that I was on was just not really where I wanted to be. For me, it was it, it had been pursuing a little bit more of that traditional corporate career path, uh, heading down that avenue, and recognizing that 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 just wasn't what my path was meant to be. And so I headed off towards entrepreneurship. And it was through some of the work that I was doing in small business and in some consulting and, and uh, early, early training work and things like that, that I discovered this field called co coaching. Uh, and that was back in, I guess, I first ran across it in 04 and then became a coach in 2005. And then uh, through the organization that I did my training with, I had gotten engaged with them as a consultant as well. And then I went on to uh, join the organization, become a partner. Uh, head up all sorts of operations and sales, ultimately take over actually as CEO. Uh, and it gave me the good fortune of actually being uh, heading up one of the, the leading coach training and certification institutes uh, in this industry during the time that coaching was just booming and kind of becoming a thing, uh, as it were. And uh, so I, I got to be around the coaching path for the better part of, of my adult life. And then it was uh, on that journey that... Uh, I ultimately ended up needing to change direction shit again, because after being CEO for quite some time, uh, I found myself in a stage of burnout. And uh, once I hit that stage of burnout, recognizing that I was no longer the person that uh, had set out those goals and set out that vision, that my vision and my sense of purpose had changed. And uh, so it was time to, to start looking in new directions again. And that, uh, that kind of charted out a, a path that ultimately led to exiting out of the business and kind of wandering my way through uh, a couple of years of discovering what it was I really wanted to devote myself to, which is which is what I'm up to now. Uh, would you describe yourself uh, successful at all of these different stages that you described? Or how would you describe I, your, I would, your yeah, state? I would, I would describe myself as very fortunate. Uh, I had a lot of success in, in a lot of those different avenues. 
Uh, and I think what, you know, what I uncovered in that, that journey is we talk about, you know, authentic change and authentic leadership was that even with that success, my definition of success needed to continue to evolve, right? So that initially when I set out on this path and had my kind of professional aspirations, uh, my success looked, you know, like getting the achievements and moving forward and growing, you know, growing bigger and doing more and doing more and all that type of stuff. And then ultimately that was great. It drove me for a while, but then, you know, as we, we begin to get a little older and a little wiser, perhaps our motivations change. And, uh, so I was successful by, you know, societal definitions. And I also now thankfully am, am successful in, in much more personal definition as well. Mm-hmm. Thinking about, um, you know, the rewards of, uh, of uh, corporate advancement uh, and their extrinsic value. The kind of work you do as a coach, I mean, often people around the coachee may wonder what really happened? (laughs) Did anything really change? So often, you know, unless you're coaching someone maybe to lose weight or uh, some other task uh, where the signs might be more visible, how, how do you so how do you sort of make that shift uh, given how you were rewarded to shift in terms of how I was rewarded I think you know what I began to recognize was first and foremost for myself was the the deeper levels of peace and fulfillment and joy that I was coming at life from and so uh you know a distinction that that uh, you know i i've made in the past actually comes up a lot on the podcast that i i i run is that at some point i made a switch of as opposed to living for meaning living for the external living for the promotion living for the title even living for joy and connection in my life i recognized that i needed to start living from those places as opposed to for them because when you're living for it you feel this sense of lack you feel the sense of of scarcity For me, it was then, how is it that I begin to cultivate that and come from that place of joy and of balance and of peace and of truth in my life? Because that that created a a certain level of conviction as well as congruency in who it was that I am. When I started coming from those places, not only did I feel those things, because that's that's what I was generating for myself, but there was a very noticeable difference in the people around me because they recognized that I could hold space for them in a different way. My level of presence was different. The level of patience that I had was different. My level of compassion was different. And so they were starting to respond to me in a very, very different manner based off of the fact that my internal state had changed quite dramatically. Uh, We use words uh, a bit differently. And for me, authenticity and congruency are really very similar. That I think that Authentic behavior happens when our words and actions align, and even better when our you know mindset, words and actions align. And that's all about congruency. You know, can you, uh, as the expression goes, can you walk the talk? All relates to integrity as well. Are you of whole cloth? Uh, are you the real deal? Uh, if you were an engineer, you might see it from a perspective of structural integrity. So, you know, this is a kind of uh, congruence that you radiate. Is that what you're helping clients to do? Or, you know, I think about the clients that come to me, um, coaching clients, they're often in some sort of very messy transition. <laughs> it's it, Transition is, is usually a, a big thing, right? And it's because in transitions, that's when we start to feel what is it that's falling away? Uh, what is it that needs to be left behind, right? And then we're starting to get into this space that's usually a space in between where there's a lot of uncertainty and not really know where we're going. So the a lot of the work that I end up doing when we speak about authenticity or we speak about congruence is that uh, if I look at the phrase, and so let me step back for a minute, part of what, part of one of the many things that, that, helped some of the shift that I was making in my life was that I had read the article, uh, the blog article by Bronnie Ware, palliative care nurse on the top five regrets of the dying. And the number one regret there is that I wished I'd had the courage to be true to myself as opposed to the expectations of others, right? And it's the expectations that we have of ourselves that are adopted by our you know, society and everything else that lead us to incongruency and inauthenticity. And so the one change that I would make to the way that she, she talks about it or the, the statement that we tend to make 
is that I want to be true to myself. I would say we want to be true to our true selves. And the the distinction that I make there is that very often we get into a place that we're still holding on to a certain persona or a certain role that we feel like we need to hold on to, certain attachments that are there, uh, certain ways that we want to present ourselves to the world. And that, even though we could be authentic to that image, we're still playing a role. It's not really the absolute you know, core of who it is that we are. And so a lot of the work that I do is how do we actually get beneath some of those layers, beneath some of those masks, get into even some of the shadow work that may be there so that people can really get back to, to feeling like they're at the essence of who they were, you know, almost like that playfulness of when we were, when we were so much younger without, you know, all the, all the uh, worries of the world on our, our shoulders. And the more that they get true to that, the more they get clear on what that is, they begin to recognize that things like even values that they've had for their whole life, they may still have those values, but the way that they define them becomes different. The way they look at the needs that they have within their life, most of the wants that we have in our life are just strategies to fulfill those needs. The clearer they get on those needs based on who they really truly are, they recognize they can fulfill those needs usually in much simpler manners than most of the strategies we usually try to, to go out and create for ourselves. So when somebody goes through that kind of distillation process to better understand who they are and who they really are at the core, all of a sudden when they're starting to make transition, there's a lot of things that even that they previously would have considered start to fall away because they recognize that all that's doing is you know, pretending like the grass is going to be greener. So I'm going to change this circumstance and assume that it's going to be better. They can actually start to see that a lot of what they might've been planning was not going to hold it for them. And so they now start to get a lot clearer on, well, then this is actually what I'm looking for, the type of environment, the type of uh, values, the type of, of ways that I want to meet my needs that are a lot simpler than I'd imagined previously, which then all of a sudden leaves them with a whole lot more spaciousness and the feeling of freedom within their lives. So it's a it's that distillation process. Yeah, one of the greatest gifts that a consultant uh, or a coach can bring to a situation, and perhaps by nature the kind of uh, consulting work that I do as well, uh, is to help a client to clarify his, her, or their wants or needs. And if we can do that, we can start to make some uh, uh, real progress. And I was thinking about the uh, um, stepping into roles and and the work that I do. So much of it is on Zoom. I often use um, the great stages of the world as uh, backdrops, as backgrounds, because I like to talk uh, with people, particularly early in a relationship and throughout a relationship, about the various roles that they hold and the various roles that they take on when appropriate to, and it's always appropriate, I think, to go beyond seeing that person as an element of production, as my paycheck, as my um, you know ticket. And I think that uh, presents in, in many ways, um, you know, understanding roles is a way of meeting the person where they are. Yeah, I think when, when we begin to explore all the different roles that we play in our lives, it's, you know, there's a couple of different ways that, that we can approach this to, to better understand the authenticity of who we are. Uh, on the one side, it's, you know, thinking about any given role you play, which could be a, a particular role as a leader inside of a corporation. It could be as a mother or as a father. It could be as a spouse, whatever those different roles happen to be. And first, ask yourself, what is it when I'm in that role? What is it about that role that feels really authentic, that feels very genuine, that feels very natural for who I am? And then to also then ask the question of when I'm in that role, where is it that I feel like I hold back? Where is it that I feel like this, this, I can't fully show up in this role where you feel like you're leaving parts of you behind? Because that'll also start to let you know what is it that you feel like you're, you're not bringing to the table where you're kind of parching and parting off you know, part of who it is that you, you happen to be. Uh, and then even asking the question, who am I without that role? Yeah, and then that, become, that becomes so visible. I'm just thinking of, uh, and I want you to continue to apologize, but that, that I've uh, observed and experienced um, in family organizations, uh, particularly as it uh, comes to succession and uh, bringing those questions into a whole different level of focus. I'm sorry for the interruption, Lou. No, you're, but you're, you're spot on. I mean, it's, you know, it happens very much so in family organizations because the dynamic that gets created there. Uh, but it, we find that this plays out, as you know, in, in all different levels and all different types of organizations as well. 
And when we're able to then ask ourselves to that last question I was raising of who are we without that role, now we can get more into just simply the qualities, the characteristics, the values, the energy, the traits of who it is that we are that isn't specifically about fulfilling a role, that isn't specifically about the skills that we bring or what it is that we need to get done. And we can really start to look back at what is our way of being? What is our way of living? And that's actually more attuned with, with kind of the, the, the energy and the authenticity that we're bringing forward. Because anybody can do certain, you know, how many people have very similar or the same type of skill? But it's the characteristics, it's the quality, it's the energy that you happen to be bringing when you apply that skill that's unique to who you are. And so the more that we can help people understand what is really the kind of the truth of that, that authentic nature that's within themselves, the more they can see, how do I pour that into whatever it is that I do? And then they're going to feel more aligned. They're going to feel more congruent. And they're going to have more fulfillment from that process. I was uh, at a dinner party on Monday uh, evening and uh, one of the guests at the dinner party uh, knew I was an executive coach and he was a former SVP of some, you know, muckety muck company. And he described to me a transformational event for him of going on a feedback week or uh, something to that effect where he had uh, heard lots of feedback from his team and how it encouraged him to build better relationships when he returned uh, to his role. And I think about many of these events, um, you know, come and it may be uh, too late. Where might you see yourself, you know, thinking about masculine vulnerability? Where might you see this evolving over the lifespan and at different life stages uh, for folks? In terms of, so it, in, in terms of how our relationship with masculine vulnerability develops? Yes, yes. I think what we find and what we have found is that there are, as anything, when there are certain labels that are used, there are certain generalizations that, that get made and there are certain stereotypes that tend to follow and, and be uh, permeated throughout media and society and, and through certain norms. And one of, you know, one aspect of that for the masculine, which tends to feed into when we are younger, uh, is, you know, how is it that we're going to go out and we're going to conquer the world? How is it that we're going to go out there and achieve? And then that begins to ultimately morph into if we're, we're pursuing that path of relationship, how am I going to be the provider and the protector for my family, right? And it starts to evolve in that regard. And then ultimately, as we begin to get into uh, maybe a certain stage of life, where we're getting a little bit more reflective of where we are and perhaps feeling like maybe something has been missing for us, which is very common of a lot of the, the men that I work with, they begin to recognize that what has been missing is a sense of presence within their lives, meaning that they, they're they never really truly completely and fully engaged and present with their families or in their relationships because they're always either thinking about the next thing or they're still putting on that brave face because they don't want to face some of the things that they've been through in their lives and some of the things that are still kicking around that create maybe it be resentment or frustration or anger or sadness or what have you inside of their lives. And so when they begin to get to that stage where they want to get more present, that usually naturally leads to connecting to this degree of vulnerability because we need to be able to get very present to what are the things that we have been through? What are the things that are surfacing? What are the things that we've just powered through as opposed to actually allowing ourselves to be with them? And so uh, as we begin to get through that process or as we begin to hit that stage inside of life and realize uh, we can face those things that used to previously be really uncomfortable and even scary, uh, we can face those things and it doesn't make us, quote unquote, less of a man. It doesn't weaken us. It doesn't kill us. It actually is something that we can hold the container for. We can be present to those things and still have tremendous strength in doing so. And when we begin to, to step into that type of phase, we can bring much more of who it is that we genuinely are, again, without the masks, without the armor, without a lot of those things that we pick up through the years. Uh, and so when, you know, for me, I end up working, I do work a lot with men that are going through those types of transitions in their life because they're beginning to look around and say, well, why is it that I still feel like something's missing? I've checked a lot of the boxes. I should be happier. I should be fulfilled. I should be completely grateful about where I am, but I'm still having relationship troubles and I'm still having career troubles. And I'm not, you know, and, and they're kind of like seeing this juxtaposition that's going on. 
And again, that's usually because they have not allowed themselves to just get very present with what's actually been trying to come up, surface, and be communicated to them to help them set different directions. Uh, so it, it's about creating that container so that they can actually step into that place and really learn how to work with a lot of the inner world that as men, we tend not to do earlier in our lives. And what's the outcome of all of this? I mean, what do you see as an outcome? Uh, well, there's the, you know, the, the qualitative side, which is, you know, they're more peaceful, they're more settled, they actually are more present to their lives, they become more fulfilled, access to more joy. Typically, from an emotional standpoint, their ability to, uh, they become much more grounded and anchored, meaning that whatever it is that they're going through, whatever emotion or energy that happens to be coming up, they're more calm. They're more grounded in that process, which gives them the ability to be much stronger leaders because they are more settled in, in the presence of who it is that they are and more settled in the way that they can manage whatever it is that happens to be coming up at any given time. What that usually then translates to is in going through that process, they can show up more, uh, uh, more strongly, meaning more authentically, more congruently, and more powerfully in their relationships be that intimately and and change the nature of, of some of their intimate relationships and take those even deeper and closer. But they also can change their professional relationships and leadership type relationships because of the, the, the effect that this ultimately has on their presence and the space that they can hold for others when they're leading. Yes. Uh, for myself, I, I like to work out of uh, three words. Or there are three words uh, or competencies that are operative for me. And that is one to uh, a sense of calmness. Uh, a second is the sense of competence. And a third is a sense of confidence. And I think as though as a consultant, and what I often tell uh, folks um, that I coach is that what I bring to the coaching situation is uh, presence. <laughs> you know, very much, I think, in the ways uh, in which you richly described it, Luke Iorio. And uh, I also bring a sense of discernment. What I do is I try to help people figure out uh, what's work? What's not work? What can we leave aside? You know, what what's really important here uh, in, in the limited time that we have together? And um, the third is the sense of hope that things can be different. And uh, you, you know, let's say that it's a, a job transition. Uh, of all the things to worry about, you know, uh, what I find is that um, my coaches, and this is why I asked you about. Um, my coaches, this is why I asked you about success in the beginning. There are often people who have been successively rewarded for certain behaviors since they were like 10 or 12. You know, they led the science club. They uh, figured out how to unpack the Rubik's Cube in the fastest time in their planet. Um, you, you know, they were people who, were, uh, who achieved uh, and were rewarded. And I find that true with a lot of people, particularly in uh, corporate um, leadership, and there is something about you know death by success or death by rewards. I mean, I think you're where where you're going with that. I think is it's a really great point because I mean I can think of you know for myself uh, one of the you know one of the traits that that I had was and have is that I've got a strong ability to make things work right. So to find ways to to cope, to compromise, to coordinate, whatever it is. It's going to make this thing work. And on the one side, that got very, very heavily rewarded. And it was, it was great. We praise this. Let's keep moving forward and everything else. But very often, it also glanced by the question of, could we be making this work? And so when there's certain patterns like that, that we keep rewarding, and it all of a sudden creates blind spots in other areas, for me, that ended up leading to several projects that even we did in, in, in the business that I was running where those business, those uh, projects, they became good enough, meaning that it was rewarding a behavior to make something work, and it would make it work to a good enough point, but it was never going to be something that was actually going to help us thrive. And the reason for that was that when we didn't ask, should we make this work? The reason why we weren't asking that was we didn't want to go through the pain of actually realizing that this is something that should be shut down. This is something that isn't working, and we actually have to to basically let go of all of the work, all the effort, maybe even some of the the individuals that were involved in making this happen. And so, when we we we've got to be aware of the things that we are getting rewarded uh, to to do, because it can keep us just focused in that particular direction. 
And it can put blinders on us from not seeing what's else around us at any given time. And so there's many patterns of that. And that's part of, you know, it's the good and the bad of culture, right? So inside of an organization, we want to have a very strong culture. What do we do? We reward for those things that fall in line with that culture. The challenge is it also can create conformity. And conformity is usually, it's going to be the antithesis of what we want from diversity. And diversity is equated to greater innovation, greater creativity, all sorts of things that actually ultimately create thriving, not just in organizations, but that's a, that's a natural principle of ecosystems as well. And so we've got to be aware that anything we're getting rewarded on puts our blinders on and it can be leading towards a level of conformity. But if we're aware of it, then we can adjust, we can plan, and we can make sure that we're more holistic in the way that we're developing. Uh, many of the uh, folks with whom I work, in addition to coming to me because of uh, they're at a certain transition point or a certain transition point has been placed upon them, um, they also um, come to me as people who are often very technically accomplished and have been consistently rewarded on the basis of their technical strengths. Um, they may not even be aware of the influence or the impact they may have on their organization if they, because typically they're leading in a research and development organization or a function of a research uh, and development organization with a lot of very uh, smart people who tolerate, you know, a lot of bad behavior from, you know, being talked over, not listened to, being thought less of, being bullied, using words you wouldn't like to hear, you know, in the workplace. And they get rewarded for what their innovation ability is, what their uh, next design is. And I often struggle with how we modify uh, these behaviors with men or women, uh, you know, who are in their late fifties, you know, very successful people by many measures, <laughs> uh, you, you know, except, uh, uh, from, um, not the people who, you know, work directly for them because they figure out their own coping mechanisms, uh, but for, you know, the next level down, uh, other potential pools of, uh, leaders who may have similar sorts of uh, pathways uh, to performance. What what's your experience around all of that? I think it it when whenever any of us have kind of certain patterns that we're stuck into, uh, and unfortunately patterns that are then rewarded. Uh, so they're really kind of you know they're rewarded. And they're deeply ingrained in that regard. One of the things we also then are not paying attention to is what is the cost of our behavior and not specifically just the cost on other people, but what's the cost to us? Because most people, even though they may or may not be, you know, maybe they are concerned about the impact on others, maybe they're not concerned about the impact on others. But usually what we need to find is first and foremost, what is actually still the cost on us? Where is it that we are uh, being held back? Where is it that we are having more stress? Where is it that we are having more challenges because of this particular behavior or action? And until we identify a, a cost that we are bearing for that particular behavior, and we feel that that cost is, is something that we would rather do without, that we want to alleviate in some way, that's where we've got to gain leverage. That's what we've got to look for, because otherwise that leverage is not there for us to, to have buy-in to want to create a change. Yeah, maybe this will move us to the topic of um, speed and agility and pacing, uh, because I find that many organizations, particularly at the board level with founders, um, they struggle with uh, a, a, an issue, you know, are we better off with him, her, or them? <laughs> or would we be better off without them? Uh, because, you know, they present some difficult and challenging uh, behaviors. And I think... Too many people struggle for for too long, so it becomes a television series rather than just running its you know movie courses it you know ought to. And um, how do you think about this in terms of you know eureka moments that are produced, incremental change, breakthrough change uh, that are uh, a result of someone uh, who's in a coaching relationship with you or some sort of work with you? 
as you think about uh, people that you with whom you work, um, where does the issue of uh, pacing come up? Where does the is- issue of uh, timing come up? Do you think about change as sort of being incremental or do you think about it being breakthrough? Sorry, that's a big question. I apologize. I, I appreciate you uh, you synthesizing that for me. You know, I, it's funny because I I would say that I I really used to approach change from that standpoint of how is it that we can create almost like a drumbeat of we're moving forward, we're making progress, and then some of those bigger leaps are going to to come as a result of kind of putting in the hard work. It's the on the one side, it is the it's the story of the of the stone cutter, as it were, right? It's not the the last hit that breaks the stone. It was the hundred before it that allows the stone ultimately to break. And so there is part of that in this process. That said, what I'm, I'm more aware of and more sensitive to at this point than I think ever before is that we also have to be aware of kind of the environment that we are operating within in terms of when that change is best suited. So there are times where we try to force the change because it feels like, oh, we're ready for it. We're ready for it. We're ready for it. And why am I being met with so much resistance? It's because maybe it's actually not the right time for the change. You're becoming more aware. You're becoming ready. You're becoming more prepared. But at what point do you, you know, kind of read the tea leaves as it were and understand, you know what? It's not quite the moment. I know that if I go forward on this moment, it's going to be met with resistance. And it's kind of watching for where those openings are going to come to create the bigger change. And so I find that's very true even in a coaching relationship with an individual is that you've got, you know, you're working with them so that they they feel the progress, they feel the small wins, they feel what's un- unfolding for themselves, but also how is it that you start to make them aware of this kind of bigger sea change that's beginning to grow within them? And then how do you help them begin to recognize for themselves kind of feeling into now's the moment for me to lean into this even harder. Now's the time for me to take this bigger jump, make this bigger step. So it's it's a balancing act of keeping the drum beat to make progress, uh, to keep pace, but also being aware of there are, you know, there's more environmental factors to to take in mind. And, you know, that's that's what we want to watch for so that they lean into it and they bring their energy into the biggest change possible but at the time it's going to bear the most fruit. Luke, can you describe what it means to restore balance? I mean, given all of that uh, uh, that you described, uh, how, how does one go about restoring balance? That's a, so that's also a, that's a big one. So the kind of the first premise for me is that, you know, I used to approach balance from what was truly just a circumstantial uh, viewpoint. And I think that's a lot of the myth that is out there right now, which is that balance is, highly structured. It's great organization. It's being able to keep all the plates spinning as it were, and everything is compartmentalized inside our lives. That'll never happen, right? Life has other plans for us. We're never going to have that level of of organization. Uh, We'll create too much stress trying to do that. To me, balance is much more of thinking of that image of a surfer on the surfboard riding the wave. Life is going to crash in any number of different directions, but the surfer is there enjoying the ride the entire time. Well, where that comes from is incredible core strength, or what I would say is inner strength and inner balance. And so inner balance is really what I'm after. When you're looking to restore balance with somebody, it's how do you actually restore that sense of inner balance? And to do that, you've got to take a look at what are all of the different ways that we create imbalance within our lives, whether that be things like uh, judgment and attachments, whether that be overcomplication, uh, whether that be over, you know, uh, busyness, overactivity, where we're not getting any time to settle. What are those things that bring instability within our lives? Uh, so it's taking a look at all those different factors that we buy into through our beliefs, our attitudes, our patterns, our rituals, and how do we actually start to reconstruct that from the inside out, so that somebody is connecting to a sense of peace and balance within themselves, and that's actually where they're making their choices from. So if you were to describe, uh, you know, a few behaviors that result from um, finding peace, uh, I mean, how, how would people report those? I think the, I mean, other than the the state that you actually connect to, meaning the felt sense of things that you connect to, you're going to find a few things. Usually where it shows up first and foremost is in their decision making, because they, they can feel whether a, a decision needs to be made quickly or whether we can put more thought into it they can feel a lot uh, greater level of resonance 
of what the path is that they want to head down. They make that choice usually from a greater sense of consciousness, meaning they're much more aware of when they make this choice, where is it coming from? What was the drive behind it? What was the intention behind it? What were some of the things that might've been previous biases or attachments that would have clouded their judgment over a certain particular uh, issue or decision they're making? And so their decision-making ends up becoming much more congruent, much more aligned to what they truly want, truly need inside of their lives. So that's one place that it shows up. Uh, the other place that I would say it most dramatically shows up is in their relationships and through their communication. And so when you are coming at things from that place that is more centered and more peaceful within yourself, you're going to be a whole lot less reactionary. You're going to have a lot lower level of stress and your ability to be able to connect with somebody and to understand what's really going on for them. So that even if they're stressed, even if they're kind of, you know, uh, uh, their storm is raging and coming your way, you don't get caught up by that. You can understand where it is that they're coming from. You can understand where it is that, you know, what it is that they may have going on for them and be able to actually hold that from a place of calm and recognize this is not about me. I can hold this space and I can support this person with whatever it is they're going through. So your communication changes, your decision-making and your ability to relate are, are major avenues that you'll see differences. And maybe one last uh, topic for us, which is, um, does that start with courage? Because I, I think in a lot of your work, you talk about starting with courage, about walking away from old patterns and old identities and old ways of thinking. Talk a little bit about that and uh, the work that folks do with you. Yeah, courage is a big piece of it. You know, when whenever we take a look at, you know, we're going to make some changes inside of our life, inside of our career, that means that we're basically saying there are parts that I know I'm going to leave behind. And that's a reason why most people don't create a whole lot of change inside of their lives is they don't want to risk any form of loss. And so they're not willing to, to put those types of things at risk. And when you go into this work, it's not to say that you're going to, you're not going to lose anything that's important to you. You're not going to lose anything that matters to you. As a matter of fact, you're going to regain so much of it. But when we walk away from those old stories, when we walk away from the previous patterns that feel so familiar to us, that can bring up a lot of fear and it can bring up a lot of uncertainty. And so those moments take courage for us to be able to say, I understand this is going to be uncomfortable. I understand this is not always going to feel good, but I understand I'm trying to create something different in my life because I am after a, an experience that feels deeper, that feels richer, that feels more congruent to who the truth of, of who it is that I am. And so that, that takes courage to walk that path. Yes. Um, and that's a great place, uh, I think, for us to begin to uh, wrap up with Luke Iorio. And um, I'd encourage everyone um, who wants to learn more and who wanted after this uh, uh, conversation with Luke uh, to tune into his uh, podcast on this walk and also to visit that website on thiswalk.com um, because you're going to hear more about uh, uh, this journey, how Luke walks alongside his listeners uh, and how he explores life from personal journey perspective and touching on the path to meaning, the search for balance, acceptance, forgiveness, and much more. Luke, it's just been an absolute joy to be part of a conversation with you uh, today. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I very much appreciated it. And until the next episode of Authentic Change with Mike Horn, stay well. Thank you for listening to the Authentic Change podcast. I'm delighted that you've tuned in to listen. Please visit the show notes for links to topics discussed in today's podcast. To download a free ebook on authentic change and leadership and to subscribe to my newsletter, please visit mike-horn.com. Once again, m-i-k-e-h-o-r-n-e.com, mike-horn.com. Once again, thank you for listening to the Authentic Change Podcast.